Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you our CEO, President and CEO, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Tanya Winders. And Tanya, you can take it away. Great, thank you so much, Sally, and thank you for doing the housekeeping this afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm Tanya Winders, the President and CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our COVID-19 in 2021 webinar series, Ringing in Expectations for the New Year. Um, again, this is the continuation of a series that we began in March of 20. 20 when the pandemic began and we're excited to continue this journey alongside each of you in 2021. Again, this is the 19th and we've currently had over 42,000 people who have participated in these COVID webinars over the course of the last 10 months. We all know that at Allergy and Asthma Network, it's our mission to end the needless death and suffering due to asthma, allergies, and related conditions through our four mission areas of outreach, education, advocacy, and research. The COVID-19 virus has had a huge impact on everyone's lives, not just those that are living with allergies and asthma, but we've just been through a year that no one could have predicted or expected. Today, we're going to look at where we are and what we expect in the new year of 2021. So if you've been with us throughout the series, then you're very familiar with our speakers today. Um, certainly Dr. Purvi Parikh, who is an adult and pediatric allergist and immunologist at Allergy and Asthma Associates of Murray Hill, has been our current um, lead speaker on these webinars. She is currently on faculty as a clinical assistant professor in both departments of medicine and pediatrics at NYU School of Medicine. And she certainly is very passionate about health policy serves on the board of directors of the Advocacy Council of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dr. Parikh is the spokesperson for Allergy and Asthma Network, and she frequently makes appearances as a medical contributor on our behalf to major network news like NBC, Fox, CNN, Wall Street Journal, and CBS. She also has her own monthly column in the U.S. News and World Report, and she lives on the front lines of the viral outbreak in New York City, where she has been very involved in the vaccine development for COVID-19. So welcome, Dr. Preek, and we look forward to our time together today. So in our time and our outline, we'll go over, as we always do, the current state of COVID-19, and then we'll take a quick look back at 2020, provide a vaccine update, and then also give an overview of some social and school thoughts as we turn the calendar into the new year. And then finally, we'll wrap up our time with what we expect to see throughout the remainder of 2021. So the current state of COVID-19. Again, uh, if you've been with us over the course of time, you know that we do always turn to the Johns Hopkins global map and the Center for COVID-19 Coronavirus Information. So currently we have over 87 million global cases with it, over 21 million of those coming from the United States. We also have the, the tracking of the global death toll, which is very close now to 2 million lives lost due to COVID-19 and over 360,000 of those coming from the United States. Uh, again, this has become a resource that we can all rely on to have the most up-to-date and credible information when it comes to the statistics. When we look at the CDC and the numbers that the CDC is reporting, and, and again, the average daily case rates that uh, continue to rise over the last seven days, you can see where there are very high rates in states like California, Tennessee, Arkansas, Oklahoma, uh, certainly areas of the Northeast where those average daily case rates are exceeding 60 per 100,000 in the last seven days. Um, again, you can see that the CDC continues to validate over 20 million total cases and over 350,000 deaths. And next slide. When we hear from the headlines and turn on the, the six o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock news, depending on the time zone you're in, certainly we know that <clears throat> in the news, there's been emphasis around the World Health Organization and the continued approved emergency use of the, of the Pfizer vaccine. 
We also have continued to hear from our nation's top leader in immunology, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who says we're not where we want to be, um, we're going to be on vaccine, vaccinations and the vaccine dissemination. <clears throat> but he continues to say that he believes we can get there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then I think of note in the last 24 hours, as we know, as, as many of you have heard, and certainly should not be overshadowed by the news of what happened in the Capitol yesterday, is that unfortunately January 6th marked the number one highest death toll day due to COVID-19 with 3,865 COVID-19 deaths reported by the CDC. Again, when we look over the course of time and how these new cases are trending by day, you can see that we still continue to be on this peak post Thanksgiving and then uh, again post the Christmas holiday. So we're continuing to see those new cases by day uh, uh, very close, if not exceeding that 200,000 case per day mark. So next we'll go to our first poll. And um, Sally, if we could go back one slide. When do you expect that we'll have moved into what we might call the next normal? So as we launch that poll, here you can see um, that we have several options. You can select February 2021, May 2021, September 2021. It won't be likely be until 2022 or I don't have any idea and I definitely don't want to take a guess. So we've opened the poll, go ahead and cast your response and we'll sh leave it open for just another moment or two and then share with the group. I wish my crystal ball were working a bit more clearly these days, but, um, it really isn't, and so I think that in some respects, this is all our, our very best guess best based on what we've heard and, and seen in the reports thus far. So I um, had the results here, and as you can see, it's about 40% that are saying September 2021, so Q3, some are saying 43%, won't be until 2022, but I think that we're very safe in saying that most of us believe it will be the latter part of 2021 or early 2022 before we begin to see that quote unquote next normal. Sally, you'll have to close out the poll and then proceed to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's take a quick look back at 2020 and how things have continued to progress um, in relation to the pandemic and the coronavirus. Uh, first, we know that unfortunately the socioeconomically vulnerable population is more likely than the general population um, to contract co coronavirus, but also to have access to testing and also more likely to develop a severe case and or die from coronavirus. So you can see here that in those that have severe housing problems or unemployment, that that rate is much higher than the general population. And then when you add in things like incarceration, poverty, food insecurity, and neighborhood stress, again, unfortunately, the likelihood of death due to COVID is uh, a much higher multiplier than the general population. Conditions that have been tied to worsening COVID-19 outcomes. Again, we've, you've heard this consistently, but there are these underlying health conditions like obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and even COPD that are being shown across the world um, to have a significant impact on worse outcomes of COVID-19. And this is a chart that shows that uh, from Germany to the U.S. to the U.K. and even into areas like China and Japan. 
So as of April 15th, we now know that 191 governments have actually closed K through 12 schools due to the coronavirus. So the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is, is certainly far reaching. It's not only a health impact, there is a, a socioeconomic and a psychological impact. And school closures with over 1.6 children, 1.6 billion children being affected is one of the most evident changes in our culture as a result of the pandemic. The truth is there are many different things that could impact this. One thought has been around public transportation and shared uh, mobility. And so less than 10% of survey respondents actually had believed that it's safe to share car rides or, or to um, have that safety when traveling in groups. And so most people are preferring their private vehicle and or walking or, bi or biking. And when it comes to business, we have heard very clearly from executives that their companies have responded to a range of different COVID-19 um, effects and, and times that have been required to respond to these or implement changes as a result of the pandemic. And certainly things like remote working, which really was not a universal behavior prior to COVID-19 has um, had a, a very vast acceleration factor. And then when we look at things like changing customer needs and expectations and definitely um, migration of things to um, a net, a telehealth and networking capacity and just business operations and the way that advanced technologies are being used in business decision making, um, all of this has accelerated in a fashion that probably few of us could have ever anticipated prior to the pandemic. So this is a chart that actually shows um, annual detections of influenza from 2014 to 2019 in the Northern Hemisphere. And we know that each year the rates of influenza can vary. And here you can see that, um, again, these are some of the rates over the last several years um, relate, relative to flu rates and how it impacted the Northern Hemisphere and the impact to society. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Parikh, and she's going to provide us an update when it comes to the vaccines. Dr. Parikh? Um, yes, thank you very much. And, you know, Happy New Year to everybody tuning in. Um, so, you know, the vaccines have been a hot topic, especially in the last month, as we've had both Moderna and Pfizer um, receive their emergency approval, as well as um, many healthcare workers in phase 1a and now 1b um, folks are getting vaccinated as well too um, soon we should have also a third or fourth vaccine with astrazeneca or johnson and johnson as you know the uk already has um, that third one approved so again as we move forward um, we should hopefully have more options for people as well as uh, more doses So, you know, vaccinations in the U.S., particularly focusing there, um, so far about 17 million doses have been um, distributed, and the total number of people, unfortunately, that have been vaccinated is only 5 million. So as you can tell, that's a, quite a large disparity, um, and part of the rollout, unfortunately, hasn't been as smooth or efficient as we would have liked in all of the states, but hopefully we can speed that up because, as you know, uh, many areas of our country are uh, critical in terms of COVID-19 cases. So the sooner we can get people vaccinated, the better in this pandemic. And of course, you know, the questions that I get asked frequently, and then I'm sure is on everybody's minds, is the vaccine safe? When will the vaccine be available to the general public? And how long after the vaccine will we be safer? Uh, and we'll kind of go through some of these things. But, you know, overall, uh, just briefly, yes, it is safe. I actually have received my first dose about two weeks ago, and I'm looking forward to getting the second one. And it is already starting to be available to the general public. So certain states have already moved into phase 1B, which is great as well, because we need to get more people vaccinated to get to that herd immunity. 
And the last question, we don't really know. You know, as we learn more and more data comes out about the vaccine, we will get that information. But right now, estimates are looking at even 70 to even up to 85 percent of the general population really needs to be vaccinated and immune um, to reach that herd immunity. Um, you know, if I've already had COVID-19, should I get the vaccine? Again, we'll go more into that, but the short answer is yes. Um, the allergy question is huge. And I know for many on this um, webinar, it's a big issue. Um, is there latex in the vaccines? Um, no, there is not. Um, and is one kind of vaccine better than the other? And again, we've mentioned this before, we can't really make that um, statement, you know, until there is a study where all of the vaccines are kind of compared head to head uh, in a scientific way, we really can't say one is better or not. And for a while, I don't think we'll really have a choice of which we can get. So the vaccine, as you've seen in the last few weeks, uh, many healthcare workers have been vaccinated, many public figures, uh, such as the uh, president-elect and vice president-elect have been vaccinated which is important. I think leadership should show that they're behind the vaccine. Um, also, you know, the va vaccine efficacy and coverage are also both important. Uh, the vaccination alone may not achieve uh, herd immunity. You know, we it's going to be a concerted effort. Um, and the good news is, at least from what we're seeing from both clinical trials with the two mRNA vaccines, Pfizer as well as Moderna, that the efficacy looks pretty good, at least in the short term. Now, the question will be, um, how good will that efficacy be, you know, a year down the road or two years down the road? And that's why we're doing these studies. And most of the study participants will be followed um, at, for minimum two years, if not more. Um, and again, herd immunity is not the only way that we will re achieve. Um, and herd immunity won't only be achieved through the vaccine, it will be a concerted effort of both vaccine and natural immunity. But just to give you some perspective, virtually no infectious disease has reached herd immunity without a vaccine. So that's why the vaccine is so crucial in us moving forward. So some health projections um, looking into the upcoming year. So long-term effects of COVID-19, so post-COVID-19 syndrome or long COVID-19 um, is really a hot topic right now. We have data showing from a recent study actually that even six, seven months later of uh, people who've recovered from COVID-19, many are still not able to work or function in their normal capacity. So this is yet another mystery of this virus that many of us are studying. Um, older people with comorbidities most likely to have these long-term effects, but really it can affect anyone of any age, and that's very true. I mean, I personally have seen patients of every age, healthy, those with comorbidities that are still struggling months later. Many of the symptoms that linger can vary, but um, common ones are fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, joint pain, chest pain. Uh, muscle pain or headache, um, you can have palpitations or fast pounding heartbeat, loss of smell or taste, um, memory, concentration or sleep problems, as well as uh, rash or hair loss. Organ damage um, is, you know, no small thing. Primarily, uh, COVID-19 affects the lungs but can damage virtually every organ system. Um, the heart can have lasting damage to heart muscle, even for mild cases. Um, we, we even found this in college athletes, actually, who tested positive for COVID-19. Even if they didn't have symptoms, we found evidence of inflammation in their heart muscle. And, you know, a college athlete is probably one of the healthiest people you can find. Um, may increase risk of heart failure or complications. Um, lungs, long-standing damage to air sacs uh, resulting in scar tissue. And of course, that can increase breathing problems. Many um, COVID survivors have undergone lung transplants, including one who was, I think, believe only 18 years old, um, also didn't have any pre-existing medical problems. And the brain, so it can cause stroke, seizures, Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we don't know what will happen from COVID 20, 30 years down the line. Are these people at increased risk of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's? Um, one of my psychiatry colleagues, uh, numerous ones actually, had told me that they're even seeing uh, COVID-induced psychosis in people who had no prior history of uh, mental illness. So 
Um, it, this is not any small thing, even if you know people do recover. Blood clots and vessel issues. This has been a big mystery of COVID-19 that it really does make the blood cells more likely to clump and clot. And these clots can cause heart attacks, they can cause strokes, they can travel to your lungs and even cause uh, pulmonary emboli. And most COVID uh, damage is actually from very small clots that can block capillaries and heart muscle, but really anywhere in your body. So it can affect your lungs, legs, liver, and kidney. Um, and of course, uh, may increase liver and kidney issues. So mood and fatigue also are, are affected. So time in the I, ER or ICU on a ventilator can lead to post-traumatic stress syndrome, depression, and anxiety, uh, also delirium. Uh, and then also there's a lot of reports of chronic fatigue syndrome. So recovery, most patients luckily do recover quickly. I'm not meaning to scare people, but I think we do need to be honest about these long-term complications. Um, and many of the people that are speaking out against the vaccine often use the COVID-19 death rate as a reason why we don't need the vaccine. But I just want to reemphasize that even if you don't die, your recovery is not easy and your life may be changed forever, especially if you have organ damage. Um, please practice prevention. Prevention is key for anything in medicine uh, to avoid all of these complications. Wash your hands frequently. Watch your distance. Wear a mask. So three W's. And of course, COVID-19 on many healthcare workers. You know, people forget that healthcare workers are human also, and we are just as susceptible to this disease, if not more, actually. Healthcare workers are higher risk, not only for COVID, but severe COVID, um, than the general population. Um, you know, we are often asked to have a very strong front as we care for patients, um, but it takes a toll, especially uh, those of my colleagues that are on the front front lines in the emergency rooms and the ICUs, you know, it's, it's not easy to uh, constantly care for such sick, critically ill patients 24-7. Um, and also then to also not be able to take care of them or save them as these hospitals become overwhelmed. There's a lot of uncertainties, even for healthcare workers. How long will this go on? Will I get sick? Will um, I get my family sick? And will I die? And, um, you know, we know that many healthcare workers, unfortunately, have passed away from COVID-19. There's anxiety, there's fear, sleep issues, sense of impending doom. And yeah, there, there is a lot of crying and, and the shifts and, and worse. So interventions, um, of course, physical health and mental health um, available now and into the future. We need to take advantage of these things. Uh, you know, people in healthcare are, are, were very bad patients. So I know that not many do, including myself, take advantage of um, these stress reduction measures, mindfulness measures. And of course, the in the moment help is crucial. Hotlines, crisis support, you know, suicide rates have gone up during this pandemic. And uh, it's no coincidence. And luckily, uh, we can really utilize telemedicine and telepsychiatry. Uh, so even though we're isolated, um, thankfully, this pandemic is occurring in a time where we have technology on our hands. So who is going to heal the healers? And this is something we've been asking since March. Um, since there's been many challenges for the healthcare force, you know, lack of personal protective equipment, um, you know, lack of relief, really, because, you know, as Tanya had mentioned, the holidays created a new surge in cases, and some hospitals, especially in California and Arizona, are on diversion. What that means is they are at physical, physical capacity, so they have to even turn patients away. And a hospital almost never turns people away. You know, we put people in hallways, we convert, you know, lobbies into ICUs and bathrooms into patient rooms, but so if they're turning people away, that means it's very bad. And with that, I will hand it back over um, to Tanya to go through social and school issues and thoughts. 
Thank you, Dr. Freak. So, you know, when we talk about COVID-19 cases, we don't really expect that the cases are going to decrease throughout this winter. We uh, realistically have to accept the fact that winter is going to likely be a period of ongoing case rates, daily case rates on the rise, and that it would likely not be until at least um, the late spring of May, April or May until we see some significant decreases in the case rates. And so there are these pandemic precautions that we need to continue to um, emphasize and take throughout throughout the winter and, and well into the spring. And, and again, Dr. Freak has already mentioned these, but the mask wearing, the social distancing and the washing of hands, the good news is that this also will likely lessen the number of um, flu cases and flu complications in 2020 and 2021 uh, in that flu season this year. So here's the CDC's COVID-19 vaccination playbook. And this is the interim jurisdiction and advice, the draft executive summaries that CDC has put out. And it really does help to state um, the, the states and territories actually plan and operationalize how a vaccine response should be executed within their jurisdictions. There is a link for every state and every territory. So if you've not uh, familiarized yourself with CDC's COVID-19 vaccination, vaccination playbook, um, we can provide that link here and, and certainly encourage you to do so. So it, the question has remained, will mask wearing become a societal norm? Uh, here in the US Yes, I, I think that, you know, as a society, we will be more acceptable to wearing masks, especially if we have a cold or, um, or it, it is during the peak of flu season. Uh, so we may be a more open society to wearing a mask, especially when we recognize the impact that mask wearing could have on our economy. If that's the only way that we can um, have an open economy with a more robust socioeconomic uh, life, then I think that people uh, seem to be much more willing and take mask wearing much more seriously than they did perhaps at the beginning of the pandemic. So here's our next poll. What kind of school attendance is your school district offering at this particular point in time? Is it all in person, in person and at home or a hybrid type of setting? all at home or some grade levels are in some per, uh, are in person and some are at home or I'm not sure I don't know so we'll ask you to go ahead and uh, submit your response we'll leave it open for a few seconds and then uh, share with you what's happening across the country again today we have uh, well over 1500 people registered for our our webinar and, and close to a thousand on the line so it'll be very interesting to see what the the current situation is regarding school attendance I know where I'm at in Tennessee, uh, some schools, if you're in the private school system, then you're likely to be in person or uh, have a hybrid system. Uh, and then our public schools, actually, it's county by county, very different. So let's look at the results. Uh, we see that 48% are in a hybrid scenario. 40%, 39% are all at home, so completely virtual. And then 8% are all in person. And then some, um, you know, division of that among grade levels in 13% with percent reporting don't know. So very fascinating and interesting to see um, the variation across the country. And this is the reality. This is leading to mixed messages, um, mixed messages with students, with parents, with administrators and teachers. Um, students are, are getting these conflicting cues. Guidance is often vague and each district is certainly doing its best to try to navigate the local scenario and what's best for students. Um, but the truth is we know students need to be in the classroom. And there are so many students that unfortunately just are, are really um, having a loss of learning and, and not learning or keeping up as well in the home setting. So when we look at COVID-19 and learning loss, which is a huge concern for 2021, I think it, it, we've seen rising rates of anxiety and depression among students, um, even as young as five and six years old. Um, I saw a, a local news story here that 
really told the story so well of a child that uh, did not have English as their first language and were, was a Spanish speaking student who at six years old was in deep depression over missing her friends, not wanting to do her schoolwork and not being able to keep up. So we've seen this heavy toll specifically on our black, Hispanic and indigenous communities. Students on average are losing about a five to nine month window here during this time and the students are falling more and more behind. It, it, again, students of color more likely to be upwards of six to 12 months behind their white counterparts. And so this is creating even a greater gap uh, and, and racial divide. So this um, slide here actually shows the difference of the amount of students who learned in the 2019-2020 school year and those schools with greater than 50% students of color versus an all school average versus schools with predominantly white students in reading and math levels. And, and again, it, it's very concerning to us to see this continued divide in communities of color. So what are the timelines to fully reopen schools? We know that this is dependent on so many factors, um, especially the risk to public health and the school's own importance to the community's economic activity. Uh, there are certainly districts where there's a lot of pressure on local officials to reopen schools because of that economic importance and, and the lifeline that it is to, financial lifeline it is to so many. Also the impact that it's having on students learning and their thriving, uh, but also trying to make sure that we take steps and measures to safeguard students' readiness in this time. How do we make sure that we are optimizing the impact that we can have on the hybrid learning scenarios and the at-home learning scenarios. Now, schools need to adopt and enforce heightened health and hygiene protocols, and we've seen this already take place as the pandemic hit in 2020, but every school needs to evaluate its own health and safety measures and ensure that they've got that physical infrastructure, the scheduling and staffing infrastructure, as well as transportation and food service are, are being addressed with policies, process, and procedures and practice, but then health and behavioral policies are also reflective of the latest understanding given the pandemic. These are some ideas that we'd like to, to pose for those of you who are in the school setting. Um, definitely having designated entrances and exits for different cohorts of students, perhaps even staggering the times that students change classes or enter the building. Sectioning off common spaces, marking the floors to direct that that foot traffic flow. We've seen that in so many restaurants and um, uh, shopping malls and things like that, but it's a, an effective way to maintain safe distance and to better direct the traffic flow. And then of course, to have these portable hand sanitizing stations at all entrances at the common areas and really reinforcing that desire that every single school needs a school nurse to not only assess student health, but also to identify health concerns and to support students in their health journey. And we've been advocating for this at Allergy and Asthma Network for decades. And, and I think that COVID-19 absolutely just reinforces why this is such an important policy priority to have a school nurse in every single building. So when will things get back to normal? Uh, if I only knew, and again, if my crystal ball was only working, the truth is we all are experiencing COVID fatigue. It's very real. Um, it, it certainly is something that we all desire to get back to a sense of normalcy. What I've tried to help myself understand as well as my loved ones is that it's likely not to be back to normal. It, it won't look like we uh, believed it would look prior to the pandemic. It will be the next normal. Getting back to normal isn't going to be that light switch that we turn on or off as Dr. Falshi um, says here. It's going to be a gradual return to some senses of normalcy, but also some lasting changes that perhaps will never return to the way it was pre-pandemic. So what do we expect to see as we move throughout the remainder of 2021? The truth is everything is conditional on so many factors. And this is a, a professor from Tulane University, but it is very dependent. I, there is no universal 
whole experience when it comes to this. Every community is different. And so what we've tried to do is take a look at specifically month by month, the way we think things will continue to evolve. So in the month of January, we think that 2021, a lot of this will depend on vaccine availability. As you heard from uh, Dr. Parikh, we've got about 20 million, just shy of 20 million vaccines in the market, but how are they being administered? How are they being disseminated? And are people actually reducing that vaccine hesitancy? How seriously is the public taking these public health rules of the three W's? And what are experts continuing to learn about the virus as time goes on? How it may be mutating or changing? And, and again, how uh, people are responding to different treatment protocols once they do contract the virus or as their symptoms progress. So some of our expectations are that even with the presence of the vaccine, unfortunately, our lives are going to be disrupted. Uh, we may have these periods of starting and stopping when it comes to school. We may have these periods of um, re reduced restrictions on travel and then also returning to very restrictive environments. For immunity, it truly does require millions and millions of doses to be administered. And so the reality is that this is not going to take place in the first three months or six months of 2021. We also need a vaccine that it will be readily available for children. And we know that there are ongoing studies and, and certainly data that is coming forth in regard to vaccination of children, but this will be a significant um, milestone in moving forward toward uh, getting back to that next normal. So this is a slide that we've shared before that actually um, it does have that problem ability of a functional end to the pandemic, but quarter by quarter in 2021, 2022, or 2023. And again, talks about that herd immunity. And we, we've shared, we prefer the term community immunity. But what's that point that we can actually say uh, that we have confidence that it's the most likely timeline to achieve that community immunity? And again, it, early herd immunity would, would be based on early vaccine rollout and adoption. If it's faster than expected, we've already seen that that hasn't happened in just the first uh, several weeks of availability. And then that natural immunity is significantly higher than realized. Um, the peak probability is that Q3, Q4 timeline that we talked about earlier. So again, that would be the timeline of August, September, October, November, December of 2021 that uh, certainly is, in, is dependent and driven by the emergency youth authorization of vaccines, by the biologic application and acceptance that uh, is likely to come later in the spring, and then also six months of manufacturing and distribution um, and dissemination of the vaccine to reach that herd immunity level. If we don't achieve those things, then certainly uh, there is the risk and chance of a later herd immunity that could occur, and that would be things like safety issues, manufacturing issues, adoption being slower than anticipated, or the duration of immunity being shorter than uh, we would like to see. And so that would push us well into the latter part of 2022 and even perhaps into 2023 if, if we see any of those signs taking place. So that next normal, uh, the thing is, and, and again, we all know this, some things have forever changed. They are irrevocably changed, whether that be job losses or certain industries that are at risk of completely being revolutionized or even wiped out. Um, it's so unfortunate to see the way that this has had such far reaching impact on so many lives. Um, temperature checks and lower capacity restrictions in public places, that's likely to maintain a commonplace uh, behavior uh, in, the, in the days and weeks and months to come. And as we discussed earlier, mask wearing may likely become more of a cultural norm. And so we really need to have realistic optimism to get through this first half of 2021 and, and understand that we are still learning and things are still changing on a, a, almost a daily basis when it comes to managing the pandemic.
So uh, just to reinforce, due to those early vaccine releases, we do believe that community immunity is more likely in Q3 uh, of 2021 rather than Q4. But some of the variables are that effective distribution, which we've heard pockets in the country where this has been a real challenge of actually getting the vaccine uh, disseminated and distributed. Also, the vaccine acceptance and then the duration of immunity. Once you have the vaccination or once you've been infected with COVID, how long are you immune to recontracting COVID uh, post that, that vaccination or contraction? So these are some figures that, uh, de that demonstrate the likely scenario of the pandemic's impact on domestic GDP, which is the economic uh, marker of gross domestic product. And again, you can see that as the virus has spread, the public health response has, has gotten better, that likelihood of the, the knock-on effects and economic policy response is better. Um, but again, that really does depend on the way that governments are responding and the escalation of uh, those public policy efforts to initiate lasting change. So small businesses, again, only 43% of small business owners believe that they are going to survive through June of 2021. This is very concerning, just, uh, you know, especially considering that small business is, you know, the cornerstone and the heartbeat of our nation. And so the PPP program was a short-term fix, and certainly the economic stimulus that have been in place um, and, and activated here in January are helpful, but it still may not be enough to save so many of our small businesses. Business in general, many companies have accelerated adopting new ways to work. We've already talked about the remote working scenario, adopting new technology, making decisions much faster and pushing those decisions down to uh, lower levels of the organization. I think leaders are more directly connected with their teams and and are, are connecting with people on a more personal level um, given the pandemic. But COVID-19 continues to shape a new kind of business operating model. We have to be more agile. We have to be delivering more meaningful business gains each and every quarter. And people have to work with a clear purpose and greater autonomy in working remotely. And, and employees have to stay engaged. It's difficult when we all are distracted by the pandemic and by the uh, things that are going on in our country to um, give 100% day in, day out in our work, but it is it, it absolutely essential to ensuring that businesses survive. So our final poll question, do you feel hopeful about what will happen with COVID-19 in 2021? Yes, no, or I don't know. And again, it's, it, it's challenging. You know, I uh, historically am a glass half optimist and I, I choose to be that way but um, in the midst of the pandemic it, it has been difficult the longer the pandemic has gone on to remain with that high degree of hope and, and anticipation of a post-pandemic world. So we'll leave this open for just one second longer and then we'll close and share the results. Looks like we've got about two thirds of the vote in at this point. So we'll go ahead and close the poll. And it's good to see that um, I do think we have a majority that are still hopeful and positive about the future of uh, 2021 with 61% of the res respondents saying yes, they are hopeful. Uh, only 12% saying no, and then a strong 27% kind of in the middle with I don't know. And, you know, I appreciate your honesty because this is not an easy time. We've all tried to come to you with the facts and, and with a fair balanced approach to the information that we're sharing. The truth is though, the story of 2021 has not yet been written. Um, we have to make positive strides and positive attempts every day to keep that positive mindset. We need to make healthy choices um, and we need to hang on to the fact that there is hope and that it is within that hope that we can continue to be contagious and to spread that hope to others that are struggling in, in the face of the pandemic. 
So now we're going to go to your questions. We've got about 10 to 15 minutes to cover off on some of the questions that you all have posed. And so I'll go now to the question and answer um, segment. If you have not entered your question, go ahead and do so in the question pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so the first question actually it comes from Mindy, and I'll ask it to Dr. Pree. How would a vaccine offer more protection for a person who has lived with the live virus and antibodies than, than those who have lived with the live virus? So is the vaccine better than actually having had COVID? Um, yes, yeah, so that's a great question. I'm glad it was asked. So yes, it, it actually does. So from what we've seen so far in both the Pfizer and Moderna trials, that immunity was um, stronger, so it was better and more durable, meaning longer lasting than actually naturally getting sick with COVID-19 itself. And I, I personally um, have patients actually that had antibodies in June and who did uh, true clinical COVID-19 and now their antibodies are zero when we recheck them um, during December. So um, the immunity is still not well understood from COVID-19 and it appears that for some people it doesn't last, it's fleeting. And that's another reason that these first two vaccines that have been approved need two doses because even the first dose, it didn't hold the immunity as well as having the two together. So, so that's why we're recommending it for people, even if they've um, been sick with COVID-19. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Our next question comes from Cindy and she says, data in Europe suggests that the genetic material from the spike protein is very similar to the genetic material in the body. With only eight to 10 months of exploration with vaccinated individuals, how can researchers be certain that the antibodies will not attack similar tissue in the body or cause cancer or autoimmune disorders? Oh, okay, that's a very interesting question. So. I mean, this, the spike protein itself, it's not that uh, one, the spike protein will keep being made in your body for a long period of time. Um, the mRNA that's in the vaccine actually um, is not very stable or long lasting. So half of it is actually out of your, excreted out of your body within a week of receiving the vaccine. Um, and then the remainder within the next week. So in order really to have cancer develop or autoimmune develop, uh, autoimmune disease is developed, your body has to kind of be exposed to ongoing inflammation for a very long period of time. And then and then only does your immune system start to kind of attack itself. So just from a mechanistic standpoint, it, it wouldn't make much sense that something that's excreted out of your body that quickly would continue to uh, cause problems down the line. Um, now, that being said, uh, to your point, we don't know, right, because we don't have that um, crystal ball ahead of us, and we will learn more things as time goes on. But to me, what's more concerning, as we talked about earlier in this webinar, the long-term effects of COVID-19 are terrible. You know, uh, one, obviously death, that you can't come back from that, but um, COVID-19 is also causing autoimmunity in people who never had it before. It may cause cancer, we don't know, because this is a, an illness of inflammation more than anything. So that long-term inflammation that people are still having well, might cause that down the line, not to ma uh, mention the irreversible kidney damage, liver damage, lung damage, brain damage. All of those things to me are worse long term consequences than something that may or may not happen from a vaccine. So um, that's why I, I chose to get it, because I would rather take my chances on the vaccine than have any of those things personally. Great, thank you for sharing that and for lending your personal experience, Dr. Parikh. Um, our next question comes from Dana and she says that, uh, she asked a question about, is it necessary to ensure that you get both of the series of vaccines from the same manufacturer? And how are states and immunizations being recorded to ensure that patients who, for example, get the Moderna vaccine first, get the second dose of Moderna and Pfizer as well? Um, yeah, so you should definitely get the same manufacturer because we haven't tested it, well, you know, mixing and matching manufacturers, so we don't know, one, if the immunity is the same or if it's uh, even, you know, safe to get from two different manufacturers. So if you get Pfizer for the first shot, you should get that for the second. And the same goes for Moderna. And the way that the states are monitoring it, one, every single patient gets a vaccination card from the CDC 
that tells you when your next appointment is, what you received and the lot number uh, and the expiration date which and which company you received it from. And then on top of that, every um, facility that actually vac distributes vaccine are also required to report back to the state um, what uh, doses they distributed that day. So they're supposed to be doing it on an ongoing basis in order to keep getting more vaccine to give out. So there are systems in place, but you know, as a patient, you are your best own advocate. So you should empower yourself to know what you received and make sure you make note of when your next dose is and that um, that you're receiving the same thing again. And it's perfectly fine to ask when you go back, I received Pfizer, am I getting Pfizer again? So um, yes, that is extremely important. Great. Now our next question comes from Paul who says, can someone who has taken the vaccine actually still pass on COVID to others who have not been vaccinated? Explain a little bit about the fact that the vaccine is not an active vaccine. Right. So, you know, that you aren't getting sick with COVID uh, when you get the vaccine. So you're correct. There's no dead or live virus uh, in the vaccine itself. So if you get the vaccine, you're not putting anyone around you at risk. So that's good news. Um, but, you know, what we don't have information on yet is about whether you can still be an asymptomatic carrier and transmit the virus even after you've been vaccinated, meaning if you just naturally catch COVID-19 from the community. We should have that data soon. Uh, both companies are looking at that. Since we are in the pandemic, the first goal was to first make sure that it was um, safe and it prevented uh, active infection and it prevented severe infection. So we know that so far. Now the next step is we're gonna be looking at asymptomatic transmission. So that's why it's important to keep those masks on and keep distancing until we have that data confirmed. And, and to just piggyback on that, to increase the confidence of the COVID-19 vaccines, are phase four trials actually ongoing and taking place for Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines? And do we have any idea when that data might be reading out? Yes, yeah, so uh, phase one, two, and three, all of those people are already gonna be locked in for the next two years. So they will be followed. And then phase four, you know, once the formal, um, right now we just have emergency use approval. So phase four hasn't started yet, but once there's the official FDA approval, then phase four will continue as well. And I know people who were not studied in those trials, but who did receive the vaccine. So uh, breastfeeding women, pregnant women, they're all um, entering as well into a registry so they can be followed as well. So we're, we're collecting data kind of from all around and for a very long time nothing is going to stop you know this is going to be going on for years we're going to be collecting data so our next question goes comes from jennifer who asks can are there any symptoms of covid 19 that are actually contagious after the 14 day period um, she's trying to understand if, if it's safe for students to return to school even after symptoms have improved or they have no they no longer have fever uh, yeah, so generally, uh, this current CDC recommendation is, you know, 14 days from symptom onset. Um, you know, I also recommend um, getting tested to be sure that your uh, PCR is negative. Um, unfortunately, though, some people, and again, it's another mystery, we don't know why, can remain positive for far after they've even recovered from the illness. So that's why that 14 day measure is there. But the good news is your most uh, infectious and at risk of infecting others while you're having active symptoms. So it's a fever, chills, cough, uh, malaise. So as long as those have cleared and it's a good two weeks after that, um, then the risk of transmission is relatively low. But again, this is why, you know, we encourage schools to also have those mitigation strategies in place, uh, such as the masking and distancing, uh, because you never know. And it's always better to be cautious than not cautious. Yes. So I have a lot of questions around vaccine safety and um, pre-existing conditions and prior characterization of vaccines for teachers and other school staff. And I want to point out that our next um, webinar is going to be focused solely on these kinds of topics. But since we've just got a few minutes left, the final question is one that we have gotten very routinely at Allergy and Asthma Network. So this person says, I'd like to receive some specific guidance on vaccine with pre-existing allergies, specifically in possible uh, anaphylaxis for those mm -hmm. that are living with peanut, tree nut, or shellfish allergy. 
Right. Yeah. And this is an important uh, question to end on. So in our clinical trials, we actually included people with uh, allergies, even severe food allergies, um, to receive the vaccine. And only people who had um, allergic reactions or adverse reactions to vaccines specifically were excluded. So thousands of people with allergies received uh, the vaccine during the trials and did very well. Even after now, as we roll it out, you know, I know the news loves to focus on the uh, cases of allergic reactions, but if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, there's been um, around, I'd say, handful, 10 or less cases in the U.S., and we've had close to 5 million people vaccinated. Just to, And out of those 5 million, many have severe allergies and have done very, very well. So the current recommendation is that unless you're allergic to an ingredient in the vaccine, uh, specifically polyethylene glycol or anything else in the vaccine, um, you should not avoid it. It's safe for people with allergies to take it. But what we recommend is that you get it in a medical facility that's equipped to treat anaphylaxis and that you wait for 30 minutes uh, afterwards. So there's a longer wait period for those who have allergies versus those who have who do not. But the risk of not getting the vaccine is far worse. Um, and actually, from just a statistic standpoint, you're actually more likely to be hit by lightning um, than to have an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine if that helps calm some fears. So I'm really glad this question was asked because I know there's a lot of um, worry out there in the allergic community. Yes, and, and it is a question that we've gotten very frequently. And as I said, we are going to dedicate our entire next COVID-19 webinar to this topic of vaccine safety and prioritization and dissemination of vaccines. But I'd like to close today, first of all, just by thanking Dr. Parikh, as always, for her expertise and her wonderful presentation of the data of the latest science and, and the latest updates regarding COVID-19 and the vaccines. And then invite you all to join us for our next webinar. Um, the first is our spring 2021 high-risk asthma and allergy season ahead. This is going to be held on next Tuesday on January 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And you can always register at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Look for news and then webinars and get all of our past webinar recordings as well as register for our upcoming webinars. And then again, our next COVID-19 webinar will be held on January 20th at 4 p.m. Eastern. We hope you all will register and join us at that time. We'll be looking at COVID-19 vaccine, allergies, anaphylaxis, and answers. Again, you can visit our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org, go to the news section, and then webinars to register. Again, on behalf of the staff at Allergy and Asthma Network, I'm Tanya Winders, and we thank you for your time and your participation today in our COVID-19 in 2021, bringing in expectations for the new year. While we all would have liked to see COVID-19 completely disappear as the clock turned midnight on January 1st, we know that's not reality. That's, we know that's not the situation we're in, but we look forward to navigating this year alongside you all to help everyone breathe better together. Thank you and have a wonderful day.